Hope it, it, takes, pops it, up. it takes a minute. All right. I think are we all right, you let me know if, if we look like we're live. I'm gonna run with it like we are. This, this oh, might. Yes. It is working. Yay. Oh, all right, brilliant. It is Yay. working. All right. It took a minute to get on this evening, but uh, welcome everyone. It's Sunday Teacher Talk where we like try and like suppress, help maybe not suppress your your anxiety, but like help you get ready for what's going to happen on Monday and then this upcoming week uh, in in teaching, and so. Tonight's a little bit different for a couple of reasons. One, we're using Google Hangout, which means that my picture is gonna be up here and then when my guest talks, her picture will be up here and it might go back and forth and that's a little weird, but I, it's the only way I can figure out how to do this. And although because I have a YouTube channel, I assume, people assume I'm more like technolog technologically advanced than I am, but I'm not really. <laughs> Second thing is we have a sponsor this week and um, our sponsor is a new, online platform called Teachers Connect. And what Teachers Connect is, is that it is a spot where, you know, you you can go on and just post questions about your classroom. You can post pictures, you can post videos. The other day, someone on Teachers Connect posted a picture of their classroom and they were wondering what paint color to paint because they wanted it to be soothing for their students when they came in. So I was able to answer that question by using a picture of my classroom and saying, here's, like the color that I picked, this is why I picked it. Uh, and we were able to have a conversation about this. And it's really, really great. You can post YouTube channel uh, videos that you like, which is something that I've been doing. You can post websites that you like, you can answer questions and it's just educators and people that are interested in education, asking questions, sharing ideas. And it's been really a really interesting way to kind of cut through the chatter because although teacher platforms like you know, they or there's like niches of this, right? So if you go on YouTube or if you go on Instagram, this kind of cuts through the noise of like all the other stuff that's on there and lets you just interact with teachers, which is a really nice thing. And so our first question is going to come from Teachers Connect, but first I want to introduce our guest. We have a guest this evening. Um, her name is Joellen Hartley, and Joellen is a dyslexia consultant, and I met her at the ISTE conference in Chicago. Last last month, I lose track of time because it is summer. And so I just thought, first of all, your, Joel, and your um, session, I think they thought was going to have like 20 people in yeah. it or something like that. And then when we were all outside of the door, we were like all hoping we would get in. And even the gentleman who was in the back uh, who introduced you was like, this is, I was talking to him before and he was like, this is way more people than we thought were going to be in here. So um, would you do me a favor and just kind of like give everyone a glimpse, like who who are you? What's the kind of work that you do? How did you get into this sort of thing? Um, I know I'm interested in that. And I'm sure everyone else is too. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. First, of First of all, thank, thank you, you so, so much, much for having me. I really appreciate it. And yes, as far as the ISTE, I was super excited that there was so much, uh, so many people wanting to take an interest in dyslexia. That was really, it was wonderful to see that. Um, it was a little terrifying and I felt awful because as you know, uh, I had packets prepared and so there wasn't enough to go around. So I really yep. felt bad about that. Um, but I think that it was anywhere I go and anywhere that I speak, um, I always find this um, interest surrounding dyslexia. And I love that. And I think that it goes back to, that's where it needs to begin, is having these conversations, whether it's in the classroom or whether it's at church or whether it's on the street. I mean, what, wherever, um, having these conversations, because every time I've had a conversation, someone has come up to me and said, oh my gosh, either, you know, I think I may be dyslexic or I think my child may be dyslexic. I think there's so much unknown about dyslexia. And until you have those conversations and talk about the true warning signs of it, that a lot of people don't realize um, you know, what it looks like. And therefore there's a lot of people not getting the proper help that they need. Um, and that was my, my case. That's how I got into doing what I do. Uh, I have one child, I'm a little boy and he, when he was in kindergarten, he seemed to be doing fine. I mean, he was hitting a lot of the benchmarks 
And at the end of the year, I got a summary from the teacher and it said, um, you know, he's been a joy to have in class this year. Don't be alarmed that he didn't know all of his sounds and letters and that he couldn't rhyme. <laughs> and initially I thought, well, his teacher isn't worried about it. So why should I be worried about it? And I knew that I mean, when we would work at home, he seemed to get it. I mean, so I really, I didn't worry. And then it wasn't until first grade when I started volunteering in his classroom. And I finally had that comparison. And I know you're not supposed to compare children, <laughs> but when it's your only child, you know, I, I had nothing to go off of. And until I started volunteering in his classroom and my job in the classroom was to pull kids out into the hallway and go through sight words with them. Mm -hmm. And with my own child, we had been practicing these daily. I mean, we had this packet and just going through them over and over and over. And he was never able to get off of the first column. There's like 20 in a column, I think. He could never advance past that. And we just kept going over him. Some days he would, you know, get 18 and out of 20. And I would think, oh my gosh, we're finally, we're getting it, it's clicking. The next day it'd be six out of 20. I mean, there was just no rhyme or reason to it. And then when I started volunteering, I started noticing that the majority of his class got it. I mean, they were going through the entire packet versus we were on that first column. That was when I really started realizing that there was an issue. So in first grade, I started having these conversations, you know, what's going on with him? How do we get him help? What can I do more? And all that I kept hearing was just have him try harder. And I knew that that wasn't the answer because I saw how hard he was trying and he wanted to be able to read. He just simply, he couldn't. Um, so he ended up after all of his hard work, he went to summer school um, in between first and second grade. And I thought, you know, the, the school recommended this, this has to be what he needs. So I put him in summer school. All that did was just frustrate that poor little guy even more. Um, so he had went nonstop school. <laughs> And it was finally the end of second grade that I started noticing him flipping B's and D's. And that was my only understanding of dyslexia was that I thought that kids saw things in reverse is what I thought. But dyslexia is not a vision issue. Um, and even when I brought it up to his teacher and said, do you think he could be dyslexic? She said, you know, even if he is, he couldn't be identified till at least fifth grade and that flipping letters and numbers was perfectly normal in second grade. And um, it was by the grace of God that someone was put into my life that was dyslexic. And they told me of the true warning signs. And after that, I took him to a private dyslexia specialist, had him identified. And my son is a poster child for dyslexia. When you look up dyslexia, it's him. I mean, he has every warning sign of it. Um, he is your classic dyslexic, but no one knew. And so it was after that, that I just thought, you know, his, his life is not going to change. I will see to it that he gets the proper help that he needs. Um, but there was just something in me, this passion that I had that I thought, you know, if I can go and prevent even one child from having to go through what my son did, or even me as a parent, um, it's worth it. So I went to Chicago and I took a graduate course um, on dyslexia. And since then I have been able to um, identify kids that are dyslexic. Um, actually, I've even done some adults that are dyslexic. Um, I do obviously teacher in services. I do speaking engagements anytime I can. I tutor dyslexics. Um, there's an Orton Gillingham based program that I use that I tutor dyslexics. Um, it is, it's wonderful. I really, I love, and the more that I've, I've done it and worked with these kids, I see how special they are. They are incredibly gifted, super smart. It's just such a shame that they have to be made to feel um, inadequate or subpar in a written world. And I just, I hate that for them. Um, they can read. That's a, a common myth that dyslexics can't read. And that is so not true. They can read. It's just giving them the tools that they need. They learn in a different way than what non-dyslexics do. But once you give them that, they can read. They're always going to struggle. They'll always be dyslexic, but you can lessen the struggle that they have. And that's what I'm happy to be a part of to, to lessen that that struggle for them. That's my wife is freaking out over here because she's like just <laughs> in her head. It's like, um, it hits yep, home. Yep, yeah. Yep. yep. Yeah. Uh, oh, I don't. I'm not flipping back and forth. Are people asking about that? No, but I'm just saying it, it doesn't look like it doesn't naturally. Oh, like it okay. All right. I'll just do it myself. Um, okay. So I have I have a thousand questions based on what you already <laughs> said, but okay. uh, I'm going to go to 
viewer questions and then I'm going to, you know, put my own questions in there probably. Absolutely. Also. But, Go for so it. So the first question is from uh, Teachers Connect. And sure. this question was posted by Dave when I asked. So I told everyone the other day you were going to be on and what questions mm -hmm. they have Great. regarding yeah. dyslexia in the classroom. And so Dave asked, what are some ways to help students with dyslexia begin to access a complex text? I had a sixth grade student who brilliantly described To Kill a Mockingbird as an impenetrable fortress, but he was so motivated. He wanted in and he didn't really know, or I didn't really know how to guide him. What are ways that, so first of all, I, I mean, I, the way I'd like to kind of break that down also is like, what makes a complex text more difficult for someone who is dealing with dyslexia? And what are ways that teachers who often have zero training in this right. can help kids to, to start accessing more complex text? Absolutely. So the best thing that you can do and the easiest solution for everybody is give them text through their ears. There is nothing wrong with their ears and there are three learning pathways. You can take it in through your eyes, your ears, or through touch, that's how we learn. And so just give it to them in a way that they can process it and they can process it through their ears. So give them anything, especially complex stuff, give it to them through audio in any means. I mean, there's so many different um, apps and accessibility tools that change text into audio. Um, there's places like Learning Ally. Of course, they have to be identified in order to qualify for Learning Ally, um, but any, I, I, all Apple, Google, all of them have, um, you can go to settings and you can change it to where if they have an iPad that you can turn the accessibility tools on to where it will convert any text into audio for them. Um, there's tons of audiobooks out there. Um, if he was doing To Kill a Mockingbird, give him To Kill a Mockingbird on audio. He can sit and listen to it. He can take in that information. And I had someone at ISTE come up to me and ask me um, that, she agreed with what I was saying as far as provide everything for audio, but she said that there was someone in her school who felt like giving them, if you gave a dyslexic audio, that they would never learn how to read. That and was that my that was, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember you hearing, hearing you yeah, talk about it. I think you were there when, when that was said. And that always strikes a nerve with me. And um, I, always, I always reframe it in this way, that if you had a child who was blind, would you ever hand them a book and print and say, this is how you're going to prove your knowledge to me. You read this. I don't care if you can't see with your eyes. You read this to me and give me a full report on it. They couldn't do it. And it's not fair to ask them that. So even though a dyslexic that, you know, there's nothing physical that you can tell like, oh my gosh, they're dyslexic because you can't see their disability doesn't mean that it's not there. So you need to treat it as it is and give them give them the information through audio it'll increase their vocabulary um, it will be able to increase their knowledge base you're not giving them a crutch you are giving them access to information and that's what that's what it's all about i mean that's what teachers are designed that's what what you work for is to give these kids the information that they need so that they can learn and that is learning even though it's through their ears and as far as what that woman was saying that a dyslexic you know will never read that way they're never reading more will not help a dyslexic there are certain ways you have to teach them how to read in a certain manner and it's it's a system and it's involved they can but it, it's a lengthy process so until they get through an orton gillingham based system that they're, they're not going to be able to read at grade level so you can't just sit and wait for that to happen or there's kids who've never been identified and they're not going to get that system you can't sit and wait for that to happen you need to give them the information now provide it in audio. There's, like I said, tons of different ways to do that and tons of different accessibility tools, but give them an, give it to them in audio. So uh, I guess my follow up question to that would be until we found out that my son was dyslexic, mm -hmm. um, I had never, ever heard of Orton Gillingham before. And I yes. don't even remember in college or in any professional thought, development yeah. being taught anything about dyslexia or Orton Gillingham. Could you give a brief snapshot of like what is Orton Gillingham? How's it used? Like sure. so for folks that don't know anything about sure. it. Sure. So Orton Gillingham, the sad thing is, is it's been around since like the 1930s. I mean, this is not some new method that's just come about. I mean, it's been around for a long, long time. That was one of the 
frustrating parts when, you know, when I found out that my son was dyslexic, I thought, how in the world is this, you know, we're in the 2000s and how are we not any more further advanced in helping these kids? But anyway, Orton Gillingham has been around since the 1930s. And what it is, is it is an approach on how to teach dyslexics how to learn. And it goes back to the basics. It is teaching them in a logical way. They, they struggle with memorization and that's 80% of how you know most people learn is memorization, hand them a spelling test, memorize the words, you come back on Friday, take the test and you move on. And they most people can retain information that way. Dyslexic really struggles to do that. So it's teaching them the spelling rules and reading principles from a basic level and then building on it, but teaching them in a logical, sequential, there is a specific manner in the way that you teach them and it's incorporating multi-sensory um, teaching. So that just helps to create an image. They're very visual thinkers. So it's helping to create an image in their mind and with that image, they they retain more. So if you do it multi-sensory, you are triggering different learning pathways and it's more likely to stick with them. But that's essentially what Orton Gillingham is. It's just an approach to language, starting with the basics, the phonemes, the sounds, and then building upon it um, into more complex, you know, into sentence structure. But it's, it's a specific way to do it. And there's several different systems out there. Um, there's standard Orton Gillingham, um, th that is out there that has been unchanged, you know, from the 1930s when it was first uh, developed to some of them have different, you know, there's like Wilson reading is more for like older kids and can be used in like, a, I think it's 15 that you can use that on. Um, there's like Barton reading and spelling that's more for like the at home. Um, you can do homeschooling. Uh, anyone can learn with Barton, but it's a, a homeschooling program. Um, it's designed for parents who um, you know don't have the time to go for Orton Gillingham training, um, you can use this program at home. It hits hard on spelling. There's, um, gosh, I'm trying to think of some of the others, uh, like Linda Mubell. I mean, there's several different ones. The only thing that I would caution anyone on um, is if you're gonna go to a program that is not standard Orton Gillingham, make sure that it is research-based and has been independently tested. You don't want something that's new to the market and they've paid someone to test it. You want to make sure that it's been scientifically research proven to be effective because any program is going to be a huge time investment uh, for these kids and you just want something that's been shown to be effective yeah it's uh so with our son one of the things that was trying to be implemented was uh, uh like a program called reading horizons which was supposed to have like um it was an orton gillingham based program but mm -hmm. it, apparently like the more we've talk to people it's like it, it's it's not you can't have something that's based in something else it's either it's either orton gillingham or it's not and so that was one of the you know thousand things that we've been learning um there goes my son now uh, <laughs> as we've been navigating this kind of journey but um someone is asking the mrs cj is asking uh where's a great place to start when searching for tutors for students with dyslexia or other learning disabilities and i think that's a that's a really great question. What, what would you suggest for folks? So every, I, I'm believing we're in every state now, but there's what's called decoding dyslexia um, and they're in different states. That's a great place to start to reach out. Um, but it is just a network there to just help kind of navigate the world of dyslexia. So I would say reach out to, you know, your local state uh, decoding dyslexia and ask them for a list of tutors. Um, the other thing there are every state has a like dyslexia learning center. Um, you could start there. A lot of times tutors are pricey in that area, but it's a place to start. You know, you could find out, um, you know, what their rates are, uh, find out if there's, you know, anyone that they know of that would do it privately, you know, perhaps it's too far to travel, you know, and you could just say that, is there, do you know of anyone in, in our area? You can go online and you can, if you know what program that you want to use, you know, if you want standard Orton Gillingham, you can Google that and just Google Orton Gillingham tutors in Pennsylvania, California, Indiana, whatever, and you will get a list from that. Um, international, um, Dyslexia Association, the IDA, they um, have list of tutors as well. So there's lots of different resources out there that you can just email or do a Google search and come up um, with tutors in your area. Yeah, it's so my wife 
has found that she joined a Facebook group of parents yeah. and it is yes. invaluable. It is yes. beyond measure where ever, like you go to an IEP meeting and you don't like the way that something sounded or you have a question or you don't understand what they were saying. And, sure. and somebody in there has gone through the same thing yep. and they can break it down. And it's a really, we found it's a really great way to have folks that like aren't, don't have a degree, right? right? But they've like been through it. They while right. yes. yeah. going, which is a lot of like it's, you know. You, but it's a good resource for even teachers that, that are looking. Facebook, you mean? Yeah, because yeah. there's a lot of teachers in there also, so it's a, a yeah, good resource so, for your teachers yeah. to know. I don't have to. Everyone can hear you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Your, your emotion and like I should repeat what you just said, but I, um, it's on there. So then uh, there's a question from Joanne Markov who's saying, would different fonts be helpful? I've read that either all caps or fonts, which, uh, which your, that question isn't really. So different fonts can sometimes create a struggle for students. Is that true? Have you? So there is some controversy surrounding that because they have what's called dyslexia font and it hasn't had enough research yet to be shown that it is proven effective, that if a child um, reads with this, that it will help them. Now, I will tell you um, the flip side of that is if you have a font that's got like a Y with a, you know, a loop-de-loop -loop on it or something cute, that is so going to throw them off. Um, the other thing is any font that's going to have the words spaced closer together, that's really going to have them struggle as well. So I have just found that there are different fonts, just your basic font <laughs> that, um, you know, has decent spacing and that it's your standard letter print that that helps with them. But as far as the dyslexia font that's out there, uh, I'm not saying it doesn't work. I'm not speaking against it. I'm just saying that there hasn't been enough research to show that it really is effective in helping them. Um, another thing that I have found just on the whole reading thing and with different fonts and stuff, it really does help these kids. If you, if, if there's some, if there's something printed out that has a lot of words in it, it will overwhelm them and they will just shut down. So I have found anytime if you've got a worksheet or a book with a lot of words, it's best to put a piece of paper over it and just display to them the line that you need to read and then just move it down to the next line. And it just seems to maintain their focus on that line. Um, there's word frames, you know, that you can put on text that will, you know, go ahead and just kind of highlight the sentence that you want. Um, another thing too on on computers, there are accessibility tools that you can go into that will highlight the sentences or the words, and that's good because that brings their attention to it. So um, there are things that you can do to help them, um, but as far as font, I would just say stick to the basics. Don't don't let them have anything that's kind of funky. You just want the standard print. But in order for, I've never told a parent go out and pay for dyslexia font um, just because it hasn't been proven effective yet. I think that there's a lot of other um, fonts out there that would work. And just like I said, make sure the spacing is um, adequate for them. Use word frames or like I said, just get a piece of paper and cover it over so they're not overwhelmed. That makes, that makes a lot of sense. I'm even thinking about, so my handwriting is, um, my students tell me my handwriting looks like it's from the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> It was that one year in Catholic school, I think, that like I have this real wispy, fancy handwriting. And I, I'm thinking of that in terms of everything we do all day. Like I, I could make a PowerPoint, but I enjoy writing on the board and how often I get students to ask me like, I mean, and sometimes it's just because they just can't read it either because my right. teeth look crazy, but they look cool. So right, that's yeah. why but, um, that is, that's interesting that that is an, an issue. Did you have yeah. one? And another point I wanted to make real quick, um, cursive, they struggle to read, you know, perfectly symmetrical font cursive. If you throw that in, I mean, that just really throws them for a loop. Um, they, like I said, they struggle with just standard print cursive and how everything's connected and it does have the loops and all that in it. That is extremely difficult for a dyslexic um, okay. to write. So you going back to you talking about writing on the board, you know, I would be, I would take extra time to be sure to print, um, 
you know, to where they could, you know, see it. I just had the other day, I was working with a child and I just real quick, um, his name started with an S and I wanted him to read this specific thing. So I went and put S's next to what I wanted. And he said, Miss Joellen, what are these fives for? And I was like, yeah. oh my gosh. <laughs> I thought I just did it really quick. And I thought, what am I thinking? Like I needed to take time. He had no idea what I was even putting down. Yeah. There. <laughs> so just taking a little bit of time and I'm guilty of it myself goes a long way. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, it's GPT worksheets that people get. Oh, sure. So my wife is saying like folks that buy really fancy looking like worksheets on something like teachers pay teachers would want to be mindful of the fact that like, you know, if you do have someone in your right. class that's, or even thinking might be dyslexic, they might be struggling. Um, so to even keep just an extra right. eye on them or to or to have an alternate copy. Absolutely, that's a great point, great point. Wait, so this first one I'm reading? Yeah, it came out, uh, it goes together. I so, know. oh, so th I think we answered this already, but Kimberly Casson um, is saying, did you get your degree in that grad field? Was her first question. I think you had said yes, right? You went back to school it, and got your degree. Right. It was a graduate course. Um, so I hold a certificate in uh, dyslexia screening. So that's what my, it's a certificate that I have in there, but it was a graduate based course. Okay. And then that same, the same woman, Kimberly, is asking um, So are you big on blended learning in the classroom? I'm not even sure what blended learning is, but. Now, I assume that she's talking about maybe doing multi-sensory approach in the classroom, perhaps. Um, I'm not for sure on what she's talking about with blended learning, but that would be the only thing I could think of. Um, either that or doing like keeping dyslexics in the classroom versus pulling out. I'm not for sure um, if that. So, Kim, so let me let me say this, Kimberly, if you could if you could kind of clear that up, because I'm also thinking of like differentiated instruction. Um, so if you could just clear that up in the questions, I'd love to be able to ask that question and, and have us talk about it, but I'm not sure. And I think some of the times that's tricky too, because different states will oh, different, right? ideas in a different way or they use different right. words and it's like, sure. you know, and as soon as someone clears up for me, uh, was this it? No, this is somebody else. Yeah. Somebody else named Kimberly is asking, <laughs> are there any authors that are particularly good for struggling readers? There are several uh, books out there that um, are, are mindful of dyslexics. Um, but as far as I, I think it goes back to getting those audiobooks that I think it just goes back to that because what I have found a lot of books that are based for like dyslexic learners are a lot of times below the child's vocabulary level yeah. and they feel like they're almost like baby books. And so you're kind of defeating the purpose on some of those. So what I always say is find their interest. I mean, whatever they're interested in, find books for that, not necessarily what, um, you know, their, their grade level is and give it to them on audio, but find their interest. I mean, that's, everybody always says, you know, we want them to have a love of learning and a love of reading. Well, we'll find what they're interested in and, and get that to them. Um, but I found some of the books that, you know, are specific for like, what they're say, you know, what they'll say is as far as dyslexics, um, that they're a little too basic for a lot of them. Um, so I can't, I can't say that there's one author in particular that I like. There's several dyslexic authors out there. Um, the author of Captain Underpants, he's dyslexic. Um, yep. Henry Winkler, he has a um, book series and it's about his dyslexic struggles, but it's about a boy in middle school and his his struggles with dyslexia. So there's several authors that talk about dyslexia, but as far as a an author who has written a book for a dyslexic, um, I can't really comment, you know, on that. That it's more find what they love and and get them that information. Yeah, when when I think of that, I think of, I mean, I so I teach at an all boys school, and I have a lot of reluctant leaders. I get a lot of yeah. parents back to school night that go that pull me aside and almost like it's a secret like i've probably never heard this before is <laughs> know that my son hates reading and i think that's <laughs> of my students and so some of the ways that we've done and i don't know that this works with dyslexia but some of the ways for reluctant readers is we'll take books like um so we read uh of mice and men every year and we read it as a play together so there's mm -hmm. like shorter amounts that you need to read at a time. You get the chance to kind of like, you know when your part's coming up, so if you wanna read it ahead of time and like prepare yourself, 
Um, and it also gives kids an out. So like, I, I never make kids read aloud in class. I hate reading aloud myself. Yeah. And so if someone doesn't want to, you just have to be engaged in what we're doing. You can't be like mm -hmm. nodded out at your desk or like reading or working on something else. And I find that that helps build that sort of, um, you know, at least like the want to read. And then right. a lot of times this can be, this can drive the ADD kids nuts, but I play music behind certain parts of what we're reading. So if I know something exciting is coming up or something sad uh, and the kids will really lean into that and they'll start reading like they're sad or reading like they're excited. And that makes it really, it takes, it's, takes it to another level, I think, and yeah. makes it more exciting. But I found that, like you said, you know, audiobooks there's a lot of stuff that's available for free on youtube where yes. just some dude will read to kill a mock right. or, or, or something else and audible has we've um looked at for our son and it has really great like versions of captain underpants but like mm -hmm. someone does the different voices and there's music right. behind it so some of that stuff's really well done because like you said i think if you're already a reluctant reader or, or if you're a reluctant reader because you're dyslexic, you don't want to read right. second and third grade books no. because that's the level you're on. You want to be up there. So sure. you know, my school has been wonderful in just being able to like, they'll order any book for any kid on just about any, I've never been told no on any book. So I had a kid that was real into the mafia. Uh, <laughs> like, like, years ago. And so I just ordered like every book on the mafia that I could find. And uh, I think you watched the Godfather one <laughs> or one year it was like on NWA, the, the group. And so I ordered every book that I could find on the guys from NWA, but you know, and that was enough. Like if we could find something right. with an audio component, it was enough. So awesome. uh, this, I don't know, TPSU 129, that's the name is saying, um, what does a seventh grade math teacher do when 88 to 97 percent of this you know you're a math teacher when you have stats like <laughs> given percentages <laughs> i would have been like some um 88 to 97 percent of their students scored basic or below basic uh so let me at ela at ela what what do you do when you i mean i, I feel like when i think of dyslexia i'm thinking i'm i'm on the lookout for that but right. if you're not teaching literature or English, what what are things that those like math teachers and science teachers like? What sure. I, sure. I'm not even I'm not even sure what that question looks. Because like. you have reading across the curriculum. Yeah, yeah so, especially when there's things like reading across the curriculum now. Like, what can right. they do? Or, or right. Or, so know. the best thing that you can do is multi-sensory learning. So. I had mentioned before that they really struggle with memorization. So these kids are really going to struggle with like their multiplication facts, division facts. Um, they're going to struggle to memorize um, formulas or, you know, that, you know, what the square root of something is or what pi is. I mean, they're going to struggle with any of, of any memorization task task. So you'll see dyslexia in that form. Um, obviously, word problems and math are they're really going to struggle um, with that. Dyslexics have directionality issues. So they're more than likely going to struggle with greater than or less than. Um, they it, the multi-sensory part would be give them, um, you know, a number line where they could see, of course, that's harder, you know, as they get older, but in the yeah. elementary school, you know, give them a number line where they can physically see that, you know, here's five and here's 10, this is less than that, but they need to have that, that visual aspect of it. And that's bringing in, you know, multi-sensory stuff. Um, they struggle with hands on a clock. That's, that's directionality. So you're going to see that in elementary school math. Um, as they get older and the math becomes more complex, if they weren't taught these basics, they're certainly going to struggle. You know, the older that they get, it's just going to be more of a struggle. Um, I always say, you know, with dyslexics, give them a calculator. I mean, we all as adults use a calculator. So, you know, let them let them have a calculator to where they can figure out um, math problems. That's teaching them a life lesson, you know, on how to how to use that. Don't don't make them try to memorize formulas. Um, you know, give them if they're having a test. Let them have that formula. Same thing. I, I mean, I I didn't struggle in math, but do I remember any of the formulas? No, I would Google them now. <laughs> so 
<laughs> so yeah. give them those those tools. Um, anything, just take that that part where they have to memorize anything. Just take it away. Either they'll they'll understand how to operate the calculator to get the answer, um, or plug and chug into the formula, or they won't. Um, so it's it's giving them those tools that they need. Um, but it, same thing, a calculator is not. A give me they they have to learn how to operate a, a calculator and like I said we we all use them as adults I use them and I didn't struggle in math um, so let them have that if they can um, as far as you know, back to his question as far as the whatever eighty five to eighty nine percent or whatever you know. Statistics show that 20% of the population has dyslexia. So if you've got a, I mean, that's one in five. So if you've got a classroom with 25 kids, you're likely you're going to have at least five that are dyslexic. If he's teaching basic math and it's in the upper grade levels, he's probably got a classroom full because they've all through the years ended up in his classroom. Um, so the best thing that he could do would be multi-sensory approach. Just having them, you know, Put something up on the board show them how to do it and turn them loose is not going to work for them um so it's trying to get creative there's a lot of um apps out there that does um you know like, like say for instance like fractions i'm sure he's probably above that but you know let them see the picture of the pie with this one shaded i mean those are excellent those are multi-sensory it's a visual thing that they can take what in you, and i, I want to just interrupt you and just ask like could you break down a little bit of like what what is multi-sensory? What does that actually look like for folks that might not know? Absolutely. So multi-sensory is just incorporating all of the senses. So instead of just seeing text and that be it, multi-sensory is incorporating, you know, they're going to be looking at a text. You're going to be creating um, something visual to where it's more of a, it's, it's incorporating their senses. You're going to be speaking to them. So they're going to be taking it in through their ears or they're going to be manipulating, give them something that they can touch with their hands. They can manipulate it and it's incorporating, you know, kinesthesis in their, their, their movements in there, but it's incorporating all of their senses at one time. That's what multi-sensory means, but just giving them a worksheet sheet on, you know, it's just print and having them do that, they're really going to struggle. But if you can incorporate, um, like I said, multi-sensory, it's fantastic. There's a program um, that I've used with a lot of kids that I've worked with. Obviously, this is at the younger level, but I told you about memorization is a struggle for them. But there is a program, it's called Times Tales. And what it does, and the first time I watched it, I thought, there's no way this will work, but I swear it does. They yeah. watch this video and all of the numbers are these little animated characters. So like the number eight is a snowman. And there's a story that goes along with it, how Mrs. Snowman interacts with, you know, some of the different, uh, like the seven is Mrs. Weeks, cause there's seven days in a week. And they can't memorize eight times seven on a piece of paper, but they can memorize this story and they can visualize that after they've watched it. And it's, yeah. it's fantastic. Now, with that being said, they're always going to be slower to process. So even if they watch Times Tales and they will know, they'll be able to think, okay, Mrs. Snowman and Mrs. Weeks is eight times seven and equals 56. They'll be able to get to that. But think of how long that took me just to get through that versus eight times seven, 56. So they yeah. need more time to process. And that's one of the best things that any teacher can give a dyslexic is the gift of time. It will take them longer to process, even after they've gone through an Orton-Gillingham program. It doesn't cure dyslexia. Dyslexia will always be there. An Orton-Gillingham program just makes it easier for them to navigate through print. Um, but they'll always be dyslexic and they're always going to be slower to process things. So give them that time. Allow them time to process things. All right. Um, oh, this top one, top question. Oh, oh OK. Um, so sorry, my wife is like multi. She, my wife could have multitasking. I am the worst. At I should be like, as a parent and a father and a dog owner. I should be better. At it. Uh, Joanne Markov is asking: Would you recommend having dyslexic students follow along in the text while listening to the audiobook or just listening to it? No, it helps them to follow along. So once again, that's multi-sensory. They're listening to it, they're visualizing it, and their eyes are following along with it. So they definitely need to follow along um, with them. And two, it gives them that visual aspect. If there's a word, you know, as their eyes are following along, they may come to a word that they think is horse. And then when they hear an audio, it's house. Then they're like, oh, okay, I realized I would have gotten that incorrect. And it helps them to see house is H O U S E. Okay. Um, so it's definitely, that's a great question. It's definitely have them follow along with it. 
um, in print. So what about, uh, oh, do you have another one? All right, because I have, okay. Um, I'm gonna let, I'm gonna just answer their questions because I'd rather bring them the joy. Um, so <laughs> Kimberly, there's a lot of Kimberly's on this evening. Uh -huh. Kimberly Payson is saying, how can we suggest, there goes a loud motorcycle by my house. Uh, how, can get, how can we suggest textbooks that are required in class to make audio texts? So Learning Ally um, is a resource and it's free to any child who has any type of print disability, whether they're blind or dyslexic. Um, so it's free to them if they've been identified, but schools obviously they can get access to Learning Ally. And Learning Ally has the most, uh, they just have an extensive, extensive amount of textbooks that have been voice recorded. So, which is nice because a lot of accessibility tools are computerized voices. These are human voices that have um, went and read. So there's tons of textbooks on there that you can give it to them by ear. The other thing there, now these are a little bit more pricey, um, but there are some um, tools out there. Um, I think Nextel Reader is one that just comes to my mind that um, are tools that you can scan print and I, I do I know that there are some apps too and they might not be as expensive as an Intel reader um, but anyway it will take a picture of whether it be you know a textbook page or a worksheet or whatever and it will like scan it in and then convert it to audio so there's there's lots of different um, technology tools that you could use. But like I said, Learning Ally off the top of my head is one that already has textbooks already loaded in and read in a human voice. But there's several different technology tools. And I don't want, I hate to like plug one tool versus another because I'm going to get emails like, why didn't you say this? But yeah. <laughs> I'm not here to plug any one technology tool. Just know there are a lot out there. There's a lot of apps um, that can that can change uh, voice or text into audio and there are uh, like I said, I know Intel readers been around for a long time um, I, There's another one and once again, I hate to plug things, but nope. there is something called snap and read It does require a subscription, but I, I think it's like five dollars a month or something like that um, But I've been really impressed with that. You can go to um, donjohnston.com and they have a lot of information on there. It's a really, it's a great website, um, but that's one of their tools that they have. Um, and it's really good. Um, they've got one for reading and one for writing. And they have some really, uh, I've been very impressed uh, with some of the tools that they have on there. Um, so that's one that I would definitely plug. <laughs> What's the website? Don Johnston, you said? Yes. Because it's of Miami Vice for that. But, I know uh, it does, doesn't it? Let me make sure that I have that. Uh, yeah. So Don D O N J O H N S T O N. Okay, I'm going to link it in the description below so that everyone can. Um, yeah, and you can go to either DonJohnston.com or uh, and go to Learning Tools on there, okay. and it'll have that. I have no affiliation to them. Let me give my disclaimer. Yeah. <laughs> They're not paying me nothing. It's yeah. just something that I've simply um, used with some of you know the kids that I work with, and I've been very, very impressed. You but know, there's so much. Yeah, you know, the beauty there. and the curse, I think, of of the internet is there's so much. Oh my gosh! There, yeah. But sometimes you just need a little bit of like, you know, a, a, so a push in one direction yeah. that you know something's a little bit more tried and true than. Right. Some of the other programs that are out there are just Absolutely. like. Absolutely. And that goes back to like what your wife was saying with like those Facebook, like those parent groups. I think that those are tremendous because that's where you could type in that question. Has anybody used this and get feedback yeah. from it before you make the investment? It's very expensive. Um, so it's, and, and that's why I usually won't recommend something unless it's something, you know, I have some experience in and can give, you know, some honest feedback with, um, because there is a lot of information out there. Some of it is correct. Some not, um, a lot of tools out there. So those Facebook groups, um, or like decoding dyslexia is in the different States, I think are tremendous because you can have those conversations and find out what people have used and, and get honest feedback from it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what am I, am I reading that first one first, the top one? Yeah. Okay. So they, they go together. Okay. So Professor Ben Ten is asking. Quick question. I plan on reading some classic novels with my fourth graders: Charlotte's Web, The Boxcar Children, Harriet the Spy. How do I encourage struggling readers to push through them? Well, oh, he's, 
Oh, go ahead. I didn't realize there was a second part to this. Okay. Or are those books way too challenging for fourth graders nowadays? No, I think that I think they'll enjoy those stories, and I think that they do need the classics. So I commend him for doing that. Um, if he's reading them to them, I think that that's great. I think that you know have them have them have the the books, or um, you know if he prints out chapters, however he wants to do it. Um, have the text in front of them, but have them follow along with it as he's reading. And then just stop periodically and have conversations. And the the great thing about providing audio to the entire you know class so that dyslexics you know, can participate as well, is that you do get those conversations from, you're not excluding anybody when you do that. And so I think that he'll get some great feedback and some great discussions will take place, just similar to like what you were saying that you do in your classroom. Um, yeah. I'm sure that you, you get some great conversations out of that because everybody can participate um, when you include the information in a way that everybody can take it in. So with him reading, it to the fourth graders, I say, absolutely. You know, if it's something that they're interested in, and I know, I mean, it's Charlotte's Web for sure, all those books that he just said, I think that those are ones that fourth graders would absolutely have an interest in. And so I think yeah. as long as it's provided to them where they can take it in through their ears, then go for it. Yeah, I think the interesting thing that, that I've, I'm thinking of, well, interesting to me, mm -hmm. is that last year we started the year by reading children's books in my 10th grade literature class. And the idea was, as a review, to just go over things like tone and mood and plot mm -hmm. and, and all that stuff. Uh, I just thought it would be a lot fat, like I could read 10 children's books a day instead of just reading right. like one short story. And at first, my students were like, when it was because it's all guys everyone thinks they're tough <laughs> and it was there was such pushback to like why would it why are we reading this do you think we're stupid um and what i found was that if i read them to my students like i read them to my children so with all the voices and i'm like <laughs> emphasizing words they loved it and then we used um a program online that allowed us to make children's books and mm -hmm. we were they were able to make their own children's books and awesome. read them to one another and it was so funny uh, it's just what what that what you're saying is just making me realize that like how much kids love being read to like yeah. even kids i've had that were seniors that just didn't want to read one day and we had to read something that they weren't interested in if i read it to them mm -hmm. they always love being read to uh no matter how old they are and i just think that that yeah. is Something teachers forget often is like, no, it's good to read to your students. It's you're mimicking what it looks like. You're you're right. in, using inflection. You're saying difficult words, and and you're reading it in a way that's entertaining, as opposed to sure. you know Tim in the back row that just starts reading. Like he's at the end of a commercial <laughs> somewhere, and you know that can be. Right. Did you have another one for me? Um, I do. Someone said that they were so glad that a teacher. Um, they were in eighth grade before they knew that they had dyslexia, but graphic novels were a way that the teacher, oh, okay. which is true for us. For so grade. someone was saying that they were really glad that they, they weren't identified until the eighth grade, but they had a teacher that had uh, graphic novels they let them use in class. And that was Great. That made them interested in reading and want yeah. to learn to read. Can I ask you, uh, while my wife's looking for this question, you had at, at ISTE, you had spoken with someone about like how at some point even if you're in college, right, somebody might find out that they were dyslexic. And how two things I thought were interesting about that. One, and I, you correct me if I'm wrong, there's kind of not much you can do with someone that's that sort of like when you reach a certain age to help them. But then someone brought up the question of like, why get identified then when you are at a much older age when there's not as much that you can do anymore? Could you kind right. of speak to that? Sure. Well, I mean, there's still things that you can do, but as far as going through a full Orton Gillingham program, that wouldn't be what would be recommended for an adult unless they just really, if it was someone who was severe and really couldn't read, um, you know, hardly anything or maybe at like a second or third grade level and they wanted, you know, to read, that would be the person that you would motivate to go through a program, but it's going to be very lengthy for them. I mean, it's a huge time commitment, especially the older they are, the longer it takes to get through a program. Um, but there's tons of 
of tools out there that can yeah. help them. I mean, there was um, an adult I just spoke to just here a week ago that had no idea that she should be listening to things on audio. <laughs> I mean, it was life changing. Yeah. She was 23 years old and had no idea that she should be able to, you know, listen to things on audio. So it was like her world was just opened um, with that, you know, just by some. So there are things that you can do um, as far as getting identified. The thing, it goes back to their confidence level. And they these are kids who have struggled for so long and worked their tails off. And a lot of times they feel stupid and they don't understand why they would put the time in that they did and pull off C's, D's, F's, you know, whatever. Um, when, you know, their brother or sister or their college roommate or whatever would go out partying and not study at all and, and yeah. get A's all the time. I mean, it doesn't make sense to them. So getting identified gives them a reason for their struggle. And a lot of time, I mean, you saw at ISTE, I mean, there were two different adults there. I mean, they were in tears that saying how they were identified later and how life-changing that was for them to know that they weren't stupid, that there was something that now they can put a name with why they struggled. And it gives them um, a reason I had, said this story um, when I was there at ISTE about the adult gentleman who, I mean, he was in like his sixties, I think, who had struggled his whole entire life. And I was speaking to like a lion's club and he came up to me afterward and said that he believed he was dyslexic after I'd went through the warning signs of it and that his whole life he felt stupid and that they had asked him to be president of that club for years and he would never do it because he was scared to death to read the minutes out loud. That was, yep. That was his big barrier there. But after hearing me speak and knowing that, you know, he's got a reason for that, you know, that man now could turn around and turn the whole conversation around and say, look, I'll be president, but someone else is going to have to read minutes because I'm dyslexic and that's where I've struggled. And it yeah. just, it allows them to have different conversations and it gives them, like I said, that explanation, that reason, and they need it. Um, for themselves, but I think it also, it clarifies for other people. Um, and I know I've seen that from every age group, from the little kids that you think, oh, they don't even realize they struggle so much yet, that that identification for them is imperative because they can pretend for so long, but you know their struggle is going to get worse. But even at that young age, given them the identification that they know, I mean, even with my own son, I mean, he'll say now if he has trouble getting a word out that he wants, um, or if he writes a note to one of his friends and it's spelled crazy, he'll say, oh gosh, you know, I'm dyslexic. And he, he knows, and he has those, he's not, he's not ashamed of it. He's not afraid to say, um, you know, why he struggles. The struggle's there, but it gives them that explanation. So whether they're a young child to an adult identification is a wonderful thing. And it's, uh, some people are afraid of labels and uh, medical was always my background. And in the yeah. medical field, we, I mean, that's, we use labels constantly. I mean, that's, labels are great things. I mean, you go to a doctor, you want to know what you've got. And that helps you because if you go to a different doctor or if you go to, you know, the birthday party and you're dyslexic, you can say, ah, or dyslexic, you're diabetic. You can say, oh, I can't have the cake. I'm diabetic. And everybody's like, oh, okay. Well, it's the same. Yeah. It's dyslexia is not a bad label. It's Great. just, yeah, you need to get that label. So it helps others to understand why you have a struggle and it helps you to understand why you have the struggle. Yeah. It becomes this, not this point of like, embarrassment right. but empowerment instead exactly. where you can clearly identify what the issue is and then yes. act accordingly and i think i love that you related it to the diabetes i've never seen my wife go like <laughs> like like she, she's like looks like a oh. and and silently cheering. i love it <laughs> in that glass room at chick-fil-a <laughs> you can't your children um there are a lot more questions. Do you have time for three more? I know this sure. is going a little longer than yeah. we planned, but uh, one of my reading yeah. the top one. Ramey Melhem is asking, how do you differentiate between elementary students who are dyslexic and those who just haven't had enough practice reading? <laughs> That's a great question. So with dyslexia, it is a language processing um, issue. And you can actually find dyslexics mid kindergarten is when you can start um, screening these kids for dyslexia. So exactly, exactly. That is a common myth that, you know, third to fifth grade, you got to wait till then. And that is so not true. Mid kindergarten is when you can start to 
to screen these kids and find them. Um, and since it's a language processing disorder, they should be able to, um, you know, be able to, to speak the language. They should understand how to um, segregate and blend words back together just from being spoken to. So it depends on, obviously there are other issues that cause reading disabilities that's not dyslexic or that's not dyslexia. And usually the telltale, or not usually, the telltale sign for dyslexia is the spelling. And that is the one thing that will set dyslexia apart from any other issue that is reading related. Um, so obviously there's reading comprehension issues. Dyslexia, um, a lot of dyslexics, they'll have reading comprehension issues, but it's not because they don't understand the, the text. It's because they can't read it accurately or fluently, which affects yeah. their comprehension. And that's why giving it to them in audio is tremendous because if you give it to them in audio, they can comprehend. And that is usually what will set apart someone who has dyslexia versus someone who has a reading disability that's not dyslexia. They won't be able to comprehend even if it's taken in through their ears. Um, but the spelling is a telltale sign for dyslexics. So even if it's someone who's just a struggling reader because you know maybe they didn't have a good foundation, um, I think you'll be able to pick them apart from a true dyslexic through their spelling. And if you give it to them through their audio and if they can understand it and that, that realm that they're probably dyslexic. That's great. I mean, I, I feel like so I'm learning a ton. Here here. <laughs> the same person. That, same dude. Read yeah. that one and then that one. Yeah, it's it's a it goes off of that last question. Okay, so said. this is the first same uh, okay. teacher as before, but they're saying regard, reg, regarding reg, regarding my original question, I had a grade three student coded as dyslexic. I didn't buy into it because I knew that her family never read a book to her. Uh, or facilitated any type of academic uh, encouragement. I recommended an interview, one-to-one -one teacher support, and got her to a grade two level in two in sorry, this is disappearing in two years. She's no longer coded as dyslexic. Either she never had dyslexia, or there was a possible, or or it's possible to break out of it. Can is that a thing? I don't know. Can you not be dyslexic yeah. any longer? No, you cannot. No. You know, you'll always be dyslexic. Um, the only way to help a child who is dyslexic to read and get them to grade level is some type of Orton Gillingham, standard Orton Gillingham or an Orton Gillingham based program that's been shown effective for dyslexics. So, no, you can't ever grow out of it. And even with that, even once they've gone through a full program, you're still going to see the dyslexia show up, um, especially when they're tired, when they're stressed, um, sick. I mean, you'll definitely see it more of a struggle during those times. They can't ever outgrow dyslexia. I'm not for sure in this instance um, what it was, but with her being in third grade and not being able to read, I would think that she should have been in like a title one program or something along the way that if she was struggling that much, that the school, you know, should have intervened and should have, you know, found what that reading struggle was and gotten her help. I commend him for working with her, you know, one-on-one -on -one and getting her the proper help. Um, but I wouldn't think that she's dyslexic. I don't know how she got identified with dyslexia, um, but I don't think she would have made such a huge turnaround in that short of a time if she really was dyslexic, unless uh, dyslexia is on a spectrum. So, you know, unless she was mildly dyslexic, um, that could be the case. But typically when they're mild, you it doesn't affect them so much that school would intervene. So I wouldn't think that that was the case. Um, but it, it is on a spectrum from mild to moderate to severe to profound. Um, so perhaps she was mild, but I wouldn't have thought that it would have shown up that much. Um, so maybe it was that she hadn't had access to reading. I don't know. Oh, oh. so my wife is asking. Um, she's trying to be secretive. Uh, <laughs> How does how do you go about getting someone diagnosed as dyslexic? That's a great question. Um, so obviously you can go through school. So if you're a parent who thinks that you know your child may have dyslexia, you can put in to have your child evaluated through school. Um, now I will say that if school intervenes, that they are looking to see if the child qualifies for special education. And a lot of times dyslexics, there isn't that big enough gap. To where they would qualify for special education. So, you know, that's the first step. You can go down that route. Um, but if they're not, 
you hate to say that if they're not struggling enough, they're not going to get the proper identification and through school too, they're not going to identify. I mean, that's just to find out if they need special ed. Um, so a lot of times, I mean, your best route is to find um, someone private that you can have the child assess through and someone who, I mean, hospitals will do it. I mean, they've got um, like psychological um, departments there where they could do um, a full test on children, not even for just, just dyslexia. I mean, they can get IQ tests. Um, they can, you know, screen for a gamut of things, or you could find someone who does just dyslexia. If that's what you feel like the struggle is, um, you know, you can go, you can go that route um, and find a dyslexia person or go to uh, like a dyslexia Institute or something like that and um, get them identified. But Starting with school is always a good place, I feel like, to start um, because at least you're starting to have those conversations and they're realizing you're, you're, the school has to realize that the parents are identifying a struggle at home and it's kind of putting the kid on the radar. So I always think that it's a good place to start at school, but don't, don't think that you're going to get an identification and sometimes you might not even get the help that you need through school, but it's a place to start. And if if that's not where you're getting the answers, then keep keep pushing forward. The parents are the advocates for the kids and they have to push forward. That's, that is so big. And, yeah. and when I think of, um, you know, like, like we said before, uh, when we were like offline this <laughs> evening, is that Pennsylvania, from what I understand, is not required to great or to test students for dyslexia. So even if a parent has a concern that their child is dyslexic, they have to seek outside help. And if you're, you know, a single mom working right. jobs just to keep food on the table, like, you know, the idea that you have a thousand dollars or whatever to go to someone privately is like right. really unheard of. And so I think that's another good reason to seek out like groups that might be able to right. like, help you or you can find funding for it or, right. you know, there's, Colleges that will do it. Um, um, my wife's colleges will sometimes do it. Also, Scottish well. Rites um, will also, they'll test for free. A lot of times they have a waiting list. Um, but if it's someone who qualifies and doesn't have, you know, enough money, that Scottish Rites um, will also do it for free. They'll test for free. So that's another outlet that you could go through too. Yeah. Um, what do you have? One more? Two yeah. more? Uh, one more question for okay. you. Uh, my friend Stacy Smith is asking, have you ever read Fish in a Tree? It's a book about a girl who has dyslexia. It's fantastic. I use it for it's not something. Good. It's not letting me see that. Um, I have not. No, I have not. But I always love, I'm actually going to write that down. I love yes, to learn yeah. new things. Fish in a tree that I use it for a book uh, study during summer school with uh, special ed students. Great. Um, I I'll think have to check I, that out. Awesome. I just yeah. think anytime I can get somewhat whether it's a physical person or right. someone in a book in front of my students and students that are dealing with something that they don't think anyone it's a secret or they don't know anyone else is going through or right. Awkward, right. like is the more light you can shine on things yeah. and make them kids feel like they're not alone yeah. is everything i mean that's yeah. that's game most that of it is so so true so many uh, on that same note there's so many um famous people who have come forward now speaking about their dyslexia yeah. and i love that because it gives these kids or adults you know whoever it is uh, they almost feel like they they belong that it's almost like a click that they can belong to i just saw something the other day uh henry danger <laughs> uh, from nickelodeon the actor um, oh, really? jace norman i think is his name um he is dyslexic and came out and it was great because some of the the boys that I work with, they can identify with him and know that oh my gosh, if if Henry Danger is dyslexic, like this isn't a bad thing. Like look at him. Um, for adults like Jay Leno, um, I, Whoopi Goldberg, Henry Winkler, there there's so many different entrepreneurs that are that are dyslexic. Their brains are incredibly gifted I, it's just it's a shame that you know we're such a print heavy world and that schools for so long have have 
made everyone believe that that's the only way to prove your intelligence is through print, reading print, and that's just not the case. Um, so a lot of times when they get out into the real world, they're able to find the accommodations that they need, whether it's someone who's an entrepreneur and he hires a secretary to do, you know, the typing and the emails and things like that. It's finding their own accommodations in life, but they can really succeed. But what you don't want to happen is for them not to get identified and feel like they're stupid um, because you know there's two two routes that you can go and our prison systems are full of juveniles who are unable to read and if, if i was betting on that i would just about bet a lot of them are unidentified dyslexics who who their self-esteem got down and they turned to drugs or crime or whatever it was um, and then you've got this other group who, you know, had the grit and stayed with it and found the accommodations, you know, that they needed in life to succeed. Um, my goal is to find, you know, to incorporate to where all of them can get identified and that I just think the world would be a better place if we could. <laughs> yeah. I mean, especially when you're talking, like you said before, about one in five yeah. people have dyslexia. That is right. mind boggling. It is. And it really makes you kind of want to go in the school and start handing out tests, <laughs> or like doing one-on-one -on -one sit downs with kids so that you can help them to figure this out. Um, yeah. Before I let you go, could you sure. just let everyone know, um, can they find you online? Is there like a, you know, somewhere that they could find out more about you and, and see absolutely. the work you're doing or, or hire you to come and speak to their school? Yeah, absolutely. I would love that. Um, so I have a website. It's joellenhartley.com, J-O-E-L-L-Y-N. H-A-R-T-L-E-Y.com. Um, obviously there's a contact me page on there um, that you could go to. I have a Facebook page as well, which is just the same Joelle and Hartley um, Dyslexia Consulting uh, Facebook page. So I can be reached through that as well. Um, but yeah, please reach out to me. I love, obviously I'm very passionate about this and I love to speak to people about it. And like I said, just start those conversations. So yeah, please reach out to me. Great. Uh, hang tight for just a second because okay. um, I'm going to get to the show really quick. But for everyone else, if you have more questions, please leave them in the comment section below. If you didn't hear quite like what was mentioned or a website and you want to reach out and, and ask, I'd be more than happy to help you figure out that stuff. Um, and as always, in the comments, if you have experience with what we're talking about and someone has a question, please go ahead and answer their question. I mean, this is not about me showing how great of a teacher I am. This is just me being a weird 40 year old dude that makes YouTube videos. And so, you know, I like the idea of this being a community um, of educators helping one another and not just me, you know, fixing my hair and going on YouTube. Um, and so that, that was a really weird thing to say. But, um, so, uh, Joellen, thank you so much for thank you. one time. I really, really appreciate it. And to everyone else, Thanks so much for watching. Peace.